Thank you very much for, for coming. My name is Daniel Tisch with the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics and the Center for, Center for Disease Control, Center for Global Health and Diseases, sorry. And I'm joined by my colleague, uh, Dr. Ronald Blanton, also from the Center for Global Health and Diseases, and Dr. Uh, Gloria Teixeira from the uh, Federal University of Bahia, Brazil. Uh, today we'll be discussing a model global health course on the disease surveillance in real time. And the, this first picture is, a, is an image of beautiful Salvador, Brazil, where we partnered for this course. Uh, we'll first discuss the history of this class, um, the, the general course structure, the technology we used, the relevance of the technology to the course content, uh, the challenges we faced, provide a partner perspective, um, discuss future applications, and we'd like to save some time for questions and discussion at the end. So first of all, um, this course grew out of a gap in global health learning. Um, after discussions with, with colleagues such as Ron, uh, it's, it's become fairly clear that uh, traditional models of epidemiology learning um, don't have the modern impact that we require. For instance, uh, providing them just with standard textbooks, standard, the standard lecture environment, um, the standard uh, data sets out of those textbooks, uh, don't really prepare them for the real world of epidemiology. Um, just as with global health, we've really been built upon a, a, a model whereby we send students overseas for very important transformative experiences uh, at partner sites. Um, but this requires great expense, uh, great time and energy on our part, as well as our partners uh, who host them. Um, and it's not really sustainable to expand on a very large scale, nor is it a, a, is an appropriate mechanism for somebody who just wants an entree into the field of global health and, not, and are not really quite sure if this is the right field for them. Um, so this course we really grew out of those gaps um, <clears throat> and, and came out of a vision that developed between discussions with myself and Dr. Blanton um, last winter in 2009-2010 on how to address these gaps in, in global health learning. Um, so out of, that, out of that vision that we had, um, I applied for a T. Keith Glennon Fellowship grant through the uh, Case Western Reserve University uh, Center for Innovation and Teaching. Upon receiving that grant to develop this class, we, we used that uh, grant to show university support, which was a requirement to um, receive another grant, uh, which was actually a supplement to our existing framework for global health at CASE. And by receiving the supplement through the National Institutes for Health uh, Fogarty International Center, we were able to really expand what we could do in terms of developing this, this model course. So now we could actually not just develop the class, but we could have more money to send faculty overseas to actually have those interactions and even extend this um, for international field experiences for students. So once we had this money, we were able to start planning and uh, planning how our content would really um, be structured and how we'd use the technology to fulfill the content and address those gaps that we identified. So the planning stage uh, started last summer as we uh, telephoned, emailed our colleagues, existing colleagues in Brazil and Puerto Rico and started discussing the, the gaps we identified, the possible solutions, how we address these uh, solutions and the grants we propose for developing a new class, a shared course. and. <clears throat> And through those discussions, we really came again to a shared vision, which was much more broad with our international partners. And this really culminated with a trip that Ron and I, Dr. Blanton and I took to uh, the Federal University of Bahia, Brazil, to really finalize these plans, to sit down with our colleagues, such as uh, Dr. Teixeira here, uh, to determine what would the syllabus look like? What are the core competencies we would want in a global health course of this nature? And the nice thing about going there to meet face to face with our collaborators was that we're also able to bring down the technology we needed, bring down the webcams, bring down the um, microphones, speakers, so that we'd be using the same equipment across the sites. And while we were there, we identified an IT individual on site in Brazil who could work with, um, identified the key faculty, and helped train this faculty so that we could use the same equipment, uh, primarily the information communication technology, Adobe Connect. So once we had implemented this technology, I say that very loosely because this was in November, we really weren't able to finally implement this probably till the beginning of the class uh, in mid-January. 
But we started that implementation, implementation process and began the classroom experience in the spring semester of 2010 in January, and it just concluded last week. So we are now at the stage of follow-up and restructuring where we're discussing with our collaborators about how we can improve the course next year and potentially how we can expand this to other sites. So the class was a three-credit graduate course that was offered through the uh, formal uh, graduate program at Case Western Reserve University. You can see it was listed as an INTH, International Health Class, EPBI, Epidemiology and Biostatistics, and MPHP, Masters of, Masters of Public Health. And it had a, a course listing and was recognized uh, through the registrar. Similarly, the Federal University of Bahia Brazil, UFPA, um, also uh, was able to register this on their books. However, um, since we have different uh, semesters, this was our spring semester, they're in a different season being in the Southern Hemisphere, uh, they had to begin their course four weeks prior to their standard semester. So there is some variation in trying to merge across programs. For the prerequisites, uh, we require graduate uh, coursework in epidemiology. In fact, all the students in Brazil were PhD students, uh, primarily in epidemiology. And our, our students here were all graduate level, master's students, uh, master's of public health students, and PhD students. And we did require the ability to communicate in English, um, primarily for the Brazilian sp students who speak Portuguese. The class met uh, for 15 weeks, that was a semester long, uh, for three, uh, three hour sessions on Wednesday mornings. Uh, generally, the course was structured that we had two lectures. One lecture would be provided by a faculty member in the U.S. or another partner institution. The second lecture would be provided by our partners in, at the Federal University of Bahia, Brazil. And we'd follow that with a time for discussion, linked discussion over the internet, uh, and or data analysis or mathematical modeling um, so that we could apply this knowledge. Uh, we, requ we required reading from the students uh, from the historic and recent literature uh, many of these papers came from the experts in the field who were rec recruited to, to instruct this course. Uh, and, and really, the, the highlight of this course uh, was, the, was the real data sets that were made available. So again, these were not the data sets out of the textbooks that we had. These were data sets that were historic and recent uh, surveillance data from Puerto Rico and historic and current uh, surveillance data from, from Brazil. Uh, I have an image here of our partner institutions, uh, of course, cases on the left. We partnered with the uh, Federal University of Brazil, uh, Dr. Teixeira, who is at the time the, um, the director of the Institute for uh, Collective Health, uh, and is now professor of the institute, uh, professor at the institute. Uh, Dr. Jeremy Ribeiro, who is my, kind of my, my counterpart there, who is a um, medical doctor and epidemiologist. And Dr. Suane Pino, who is actually a, um, oh, what is it? Physicist, of all things, but she's, she's a physicist with expertise in mathematical modeling of infectious disease. So um, we, I, and then I think the key here is we're, we're linking up across disciplines for this multidisciplinary concept of global health. And then on the lower part of the slide, you see that we linked up with the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, which has a dengue branch in Puerto Rico. And Dr. Fermin Arguello is the director of epidemiology there. Dr. Jorge Munoz is the chief, uh, chief of the molecular biology laboratories uh, who do testing for dengue. So uh, we had expert, uh, the best expertise available uh, for the course. And the counterparts in, in Brazil at the Bahia State Secretary of Health, director of epidemiology, Dr. Juarez Diaz. Uh, I, I've included here an image of part of our syllabus, and I don't expect you to read this all, but I do want to highlight a few key points. That this was a formal course, a joint course between CASE and uh, Bahia Brazil. Uh, it's transcultural, transdisciplinary, uh, multimedia learning experience with rigorous problem-centered training in epidemiology. Um, so it really, tr again, tried to address some of the gaps we identified. But already, I think you might notice here some of the problems we faced. So I highlight one point, I'll enlarge it. Note, due to the complexities of time zones for this international course, classes will begin at 8 a.m., this is for the U.S. students, until March 14th, when the USA adjusts clocks for daylight savings time, unlike Brazil. Therefore, classes after March 14th will begin at 9 a.m. So you can imagine, um, as you register a course, you're required to fill, fit into a specific time block. Now, I, our time block changed. Not only did we have to link up with a different time zone, but we had to change times during the semester. So all the course advertisements had to be very explicit that if a student wanted to take this, they had to be very flexible in their schedule. 
It also meant that uh, for an individual like myself who would get there early to set things up and get things going, I'd have to get there at 7 a.m. in the middle of winter um, to make sure things were operational. Uh, students really enjoyed when the time changed to an hour later. Here's another portion of our, our syllabus, again, highlighting kind of how we structure the classes. So you see uh, the sixth class, March 3rd, we focus on the ecology of dengue in Brazil. That was the overarching theme. Now look who taught this class. We had Dr. Blatton, Dr. Tajera, Dr. Ribeiro. So we had the US and Brazil both teaching in the same class. And you can see how it's divided up. Uh, we had a dengue review. We talked about vector uh, ecology. We talked about the urban environment uh, for ecology. That was a very lecture intensive day. So not all classes were like that, but I really wanted to highlight the fact that it was a shared course. Um, March 10th, we didn't have class due to spring break in the US. Just like in other sessions, uh, Brazil had holidays such as Carnival. On March 17th, you can see uh, I taught the temporal patterns of dengue in Brazil, uh, followed by a break, and then Dr. Ribeiro, my Brazilian counterpart, taught climactic factor factors on dengue incidence, followed by uh, a modeling exercise by Dr. Pino um, of spatial temp and temporal patterns of, de of dengue disease in Brazil. And then you'll also notice the assignment. Uh, section D. The assignment, students look up and plot historic temperature and rainfall data versus dengue incidents. So again, this is trying to approach the real world experience for students. The students ask, well, how do I do this? Well, you can start by the internet. You can talk to your, your partners, your, your peers in Brazil. They were partnered across continents who had access to some of the data or perhaps were able to translate some of the data, which the US students might not be able to do. This is an image of the classroom environment. On the, on the left, you'll see uh, the students are arranged in, in a V pattern. This is the closest I could get to having a bit of a, a circular, shared dynamic where students can see each other. And uh, you can see on the screen, that's where we projected the uh, image of Brazil. In this particular instance, you don't see Brazil, but I'll be showing that in a moment. And you can see the students had their computers open so they could see, uh, see the, the, the whole uh, classroom, the virtual classroom, on their PCs or occasionally their Facebook accounts. And on the right, you'll see that there is no connection there. We have a special instructor here because that was during one of uh, the holidays in Brazil, which we didn't share, Carnival. So rather than canceling class, we focused on uh, some of the issues that the Brazilian students might not need, such as Brazilian culture, Brazilian history, and the social dynamics uh, that the Brazilian students are acutely aware of, but we're not aware of necessarily here. So we, we discussed some of those issues that were relevant to the course uh, that were really uh, specifically needed by the US students. In terms of technology, uh, we used the ubiquitous Sony EVID 70 uh, camera. Uh, we used a standard Dell Dimension 4700 computer with a Hopog video card. Uh, this was a computer that we had lying around. It was just an extra computer that was not being utilized that we updated with a video card which could take the S-video input from the Sony camera. Uh, so basically at no expense to us. We provided a ClearChat 150 uh, microphone speaker. This was the primary microphone uh, for the class that the students heard from. It worked very well in that classroom. You saw that classroom. It was a moderate-sized classroom. Uh, we could hear very well with that one speaker. And uh, students could push the mute button, unmute button, to then ask questions uh, for the participants on the other side um, of the connection. We also acquired uh, solo XTAG wireless microphones for the primary instructors on both sides so that they uh, would be able to be mobile. They wouldn't have to worry about being close to that clear one chat microphone. And, and of course, uh, we acquired uh, the inexpensive webcams, less than $80, that were provided to the students, um, provided multiple views of the classroom at times, and these gradually uh, grew in quantity to meet the demands of all the different groups and different sites that we brought in. <clears throat> at this point, I'd like to uh, show you what this class uh, looked like in implementation. Uh, before I do, um, let's see if my pointer works here. OK, so you can see the pointer here. Uh, at the top left of the camera of images, you can see an image of the site in Brazil, our partners in Brazil. Right now, you see one of the students who I believe was asking a question at that time. But of course, the camera was operated by remote. We could zoom out, zoom in, focus on the whole class, focus on one student, as we're doing here. 
Uh, on the on the right side, you'll see our guest speaker. And this happened to be uh, an epidemiologist who was in charge of surveillance activities at the Florida Department of Health, who was lecturing on the, the recent uh, uh, local transmission of dengue in, in Florida for the first time in 40 years, and her experience in communicating these results to the public. On the Lower left, you see ourselves, the US classroom. So you see me in the back and the students in the front. And the lower right, you see the document that the epidemiologist from the Florida Department of Health is discussing. This was a press release that, that she was uh, discussing um, the complexities of communication with. Uh, in the upper left, you'll see a, a pod, as we call them. And this pod shows all the individuals who are linked into this classroom, this virtual classroom. So we can see who's participating, whether or not they have voice access, et cetera. So occasionally we would see uh, our other partners, such as uh, from the uh, CDC in Puerto Rico, they would sometimes log in to view the classes, even if they weren't participating that day. Or there's one instance where one of my students was sick, and uh, he logged in to view the classroom, even though he couldn't be with us. And I knew that he was there, because at least uh, the, the box showed that he was logged into the class. And then below that top pod is a text pod. And this text pod um, was primarily used by the instructors as a way to communicate amongst ourselves without interrupting the, the lecturer. So things that we would, we would type in the text box would be, we're having trouble with the camera. Could you please move the camera? Could you turn up the microphone? Could you please send me the next presentation so I can maybe upload it? They're just basic run-of-the-mill housekeeping activities uh, to keep the course running smoothly. So at this time, I'll transition and show you um, what this looked like. OK. OK, so again, here's a classroom, the, the participants, instructors. And you can see even here, uh, I say, Beth, who is the uh, person from the Department of Health, can we enlarge that press release? So I'm, I'm asking, let's move this around. Let's change the format to ease the learning process. So here's an example. enroll 30% of the, the households that we visited. Um, instead, we had the resistance. We also found a lot of vacant houses because of the time of year, and we only got 20% of the houses that we contacted enrolled. We visited um, 911 houses. And so we did get 240 samples, which we felt was, was pretty good, but not really our goal, which Okay, so that, that worked for a while. You can, you can get a sense now of the quality of image. It, it's certainly not the quality of image that I've seen for Collab Tech here today when I was logging in off-site to see the, the, the image quality. Again, these are basic off-the-shelf cameras, but, but it was effective. We were able to get the communication across. So let me show you another example of, of our um, Brazilian colleague lecturing. This is Dr. Gami. And this information can be, usually this information is transmitted quicker by the media to the surveillance organs. And then the surveillance organs have to act to promote health, to prevent an epidemic from this kind of disease. But so my, my point here is that the technology worked. We were able to run the classes, um, and we were get, able to get the content across. In fact, we were able to do content that we could not have done otherwise. But there were, of course, problems. So here's an example of one of the problems. Issues. We're having some sound quality issues. Uh, again, I think what we need to do is turn off your microphones when you're not speaking. And potentially turn off your speakers when you are speaking. I, I don't know why we're having this issue now, um, but I, I do reiterate. Anybody in the classroom, please make sure that your individual computers, speakers are off. So what you can see there is the, the reverb, the feedback, um, <clears throat> the delays feedback. So this actually, we, we had run part the first part of this particular class uh, with students doing their group projects. So they had all been linked up using their own computers. And here you can see me admonishing them for not turning off their speakers and microphones as, as you required. When you have 10 students here, 10 students there, all required to turn off their speakers and microphones. I can't check every computer. And uh, you could hear the reverb, and it, was, it became a real nightmare. We had other technical, technological issues like that. Of course, the worst technological, technological issue you could have would be where the screen is all black. Right. So um, fortunately, we didn't have any severe instances like that. But there were, of course, delays and uh, some of the reverb issues. OK, going back to the presentation. Okay. 
Okay, you see that um, this next slide says sample view. Why do I have this here? It's what I just showed you, but it's a static view. This was my backup. Why do I have a backup? Because technology fails. And one of the stressful parts of this course was that we always had to have backups. Backups of backups. So if we didn't have a connection, we only had 15 classes, we couldn't lose the time of missing a class. So we always had to have an extra lecture ready to go for Cleveland, an extra ready lecture ready to go for Brazil. Fortunately, now that we obviously have all these classes recorded, perhaps next year if we fail to have a connection, I can simply re replay the recording from that class. Okay, this time I invite Dr. Ronald Blanton to speak. One of the, the major questions I'm sure throughout uh, this whole uh, symposium will be uh, why technology as opposed to anything else. And I think uh, the, this course uh, had a real reliance, a real necessity for the course being conducted in this way. It couldn't be done in any other way. One of the things that Daniel emphasized is that uh, as courses are, are usually uh, conducted, especially in global health, is that you have a real distance from the material that you're studying. Uh, nobody happens to live in the tropics, even though we happen to have centers for tropical health here in Cleveland, the great frozen north. So one of the things that we really needed to, one of the reasons for having this kind of technology is to have um, uh, not just a static uh, experience of a textbook, but to provide an experience, which I think uh, this technology did. Uh, we are unable to take everyone overseas, and usually going overseas is, is a, as, as Daniel uh, framed it, a transformative experience that we can't provide to everyone. But what we hoped we would do with this course is provide people an experience, uh, more than just uh, book learning, uh, that it would have a bigger impact in terms of career decisions and even how they they address the material. Uh, one of those uh, important things is to compress the distance between Cleveland and uh, Salvador. Uh, the, the interaction with colleagues is one of the things that can't be replaced in any other way with book learning or anything else in terms of international health. Uh, how you deal with your colleagues. Uh, one of the things we've always emphasized in our overseas projects is that uh, professors and uh, mentors and instructors always go with students in part to model behavior, uh, how to behave with um, a different culture and with your colleagues elsewhere. And that was one of the important things of having a course in this way is that behavior is also modeled. Modeled. But in addition, the students have an actual chance to interact with people that are, although we say transcultural, one of the dis discoveries should be that they're not that different from anybody else. Uh, in addition to this, uh, it allows us to broaden uh, access. There are lots, uh, there's lots of expertise that's concentrated in lots of little corners. And in uh, subjects such as uh, this kind of infectious disease, often you have to have access to that expertise. Uh, but it's very difficult to get someone here for a half an hour in order to give a lecture who may have a great deal of expertise. Uh, but to get them online uh, and onto uh, a, a video camera, a web camera, it was relatively easy. Uh, one of our colleagues who was actually part of the original uh, proposal for this, and we provided, I think, 600 bucks for uh, his air uh, travel from Puerto Rico, decided that he would rather stay in Puerto Rico in January rather than come up here for an hour for some reason or other. But we would still have access to, uh, to what he knows and what he could teach us. In addition to that, the data itself uh, is an experience. Uh, when we chose this kind of data, uh, as Daniel said, it's live data. That means it's concrete. Uh, it's something that's happening at the moment. Uh, and any analysis that we do actually is relevant to what's actually going on within the country at that time. Uh, the uh, data being live data uh, and being concrete is also imperfect. And that's something that students often don't get a sense for, is that you actually have to evaluate the value, the quality of the data. Uh, you have to account for the gaps in the data. You have to know where it comes from. And these are things that you don't often have to account for until you're confronted with the real data. Uh, and finally, the, many of the things that we do in epidemiology are data driven. That is, we get a data set and we have to say, what does this all mean? Rather than the usual scientific experience of saying, having a hypothesis, designing a, a way of collecting data, and then doing the analysis, much of our hypothesis was driven by the data itself. And people would discover things in the data, which is something, again, that doesn't happen in data that's dead, uh, but does occur in live data. In fact, it's uh, sometimes surprising and a revelation to the instructors themselves. 
Uh, finally, uh, the uh, idea of immediacy is that the data itself, the kind of things that we were studying, uh, creates a dependency on others, that we end up having to rely on people uh, in part because the, the data is in multiple sites, so you have to go to those sites in order to obtain the data. Although we may have 8% um, um, prevalence of infection in one little neighborhood in Salvador, to know what that means, we have to talk to our colleagues. Is there a difference in terms of the data collection? Is there a difference in terms of the weather? And some of that interpretation has to come from a dependence on the colleagues. In addition, uh, very literally, there was a dependence for translation. That is, we're working in another language, and much of the data, although it's online from Brazil, uh, many of our students do not speak, none of our students speak Portuguese. Uh, the problem that we decided to work on is a problem of uh, dengue virus, and it's a disease that's a vector-borne disease. That means it's carried by a mosquito, transmitted to humans, the humans transmit it to the mosquito, and that's how the cycle continues. Therefore, it's a, a problem that has a lot of biological complexity. The, the biology of the mosquito, the biology of humans is all involved. In addition, uh, there is a lot of social complexity. It's a disease that's very much associated with urbanization, which is one of the major global concerns, very much associated with social and political organization. So there are a lot of different kinds of disciplines that are brought to bear on a disease like this. So it's an ideal topic for a greater study of a very diverse range of students. It is a disease that's important in Brazil. Uh, 2007, about 200 people died in the outbreak in uh, Rio de Janeiro alone, uh, let alone the hundreds of thousands of people that had severe disease. In the United States, it's considered an exotic disease, which is not a disadvantage. If anything, it's an advantage. Um, students often like things that are relatively bizarre. And uh, it is a seasonal and episodic disease. Uh, the advantage to this is that it happens to occur, the peak occurs during our spring semester. So it's something that every year we can depend on to study. That is, from January to March, there is an increase in the transmission. We will always see a rise in the number of cases during that, that part of the year. Some years, there will be a very large rise in which there are epidemics, so that it is reliably a disease that can be studied uh, in real time uh, and during the spring semester. Very much uh, the same could be said of uh, influenza in this country. Uh, but for the other reasons that I mentioned, dengue is probably a better disease uh, to study. There is active national as well as worldwide surveillance, which means there is a lot of data that's generated in terms of looking at uh, dengue. Uh, may not, the quality may be something that has to be evaluated, but there are a lot of data points to look at for this disease. Well, why use uh, this sort of uh, technological connection? Uh, again, to give students an experience. The areas where dengue is transmitted is not obviously Cleveland, Ohio. That to use uh, this uh, te technology brings us closer to areas of transmission. This is a, a, a relative, one of the poorest neighborhoods in Salvador. Salvador is actually a very beautiful city. It's not a difficult place to work. Uh, but this is one of the areas of transmission, as opposed to being in Cleveland, Ohio where transmission sites look nothing like this in the great frozen north and people don't get a real sense of what the transmission of this disease is like. Go on to the next one. Uh, dengue is a worldwide disease. Uh, the areas in green show the areas in which dengue is transmitted. It's one of the most common diseases, although many students have never heard of it. The areas that are shaded there are areas in which the vector, which you see uh, over on your left, uh, Aedes aegypti, is found. And those areas include they don't include Cleveland, but they do include the United States. It's one of the reasons that we talk about global health as opposed to international health. It goes across borders very easily. As you can see, it is transmitted in parts of Texas, and there have been cases in the Florida Keys. Uh, that it is a disease in which there is a great deal of surveillance. Uh, the um, uh, health departments in Brazil are very well organized to collect data on dengue throughout the year. Uh, there, uh, it is a disease of urbanization in which uh, um, the uh, presence of non-degradable materials like tires and bottles has actually increased the amount of this disease. Uh, and it is not a disease that is totally foreign to uh, the United States, as I stated. Uh, if West Nile was a surprise, I mean, before 2000, West Nile would be the last disease I would think would be here. By 2000, uh, the United States, this is uh, a picture of Fenley, Ohio, already had Aedes albopictus, which is a competent vector for dengue uh, in Ohio. Uh, it is uh, actually a native now. It is a, a resident mosquito in Ohio. So the risk actually of dengue is higher than the risk of uh, West Nile, and we know what happened with that in Ohio. 
Um, the, although this worked much better than I ever would have expected, I expected to have a lot more technical glitches and to have days that we wouldn't be able to communicate. None of that happened. Nevertheless, there were definitely challenges, things that we would think, we would hope to be improved in the future. Okay. At, at this time, I think we'd like to focus on some of the challenges, which uh, I think will be of most interest to the audience here. So, for example, uh, when forming this partnership, we had to get our equipment to our partners. Uh, that's not necessarily an easy task of just boxing it up and shipping it overseas. We have to deal with customs and delays and shipping policies. So um, we went the route of delivering it ourselves when we went down to Brazil to plan. But of course, that has problems as well. So for example, a Brazilian citizen can bring in up to $300 of goods uh, internationally. A foreign citizen, such as ourselves, could bring up to $500. So fortunately, our equipment was about $1,000 total per site. So by splitting it up between Dr. Plant and myself, we were able to bring the equipment in with us. Um, and now, of course, that's quite expensive to get those airplane tickets, but we had other purposes for being there, primarily development, development of the course and testing equipment. Um, but but that, is, that is a major problem in terms of moving equipment around uh, according to the rules and regulations in place. Um, in terms of IT support, um, we had very good support here at CASE, um, but we had multiple sites. So we had to acquire good support at all sites. And now, for, for example, in Brazil, we were able to identify an individual who had uh, technology expertise, but his, his ability to speak English was, was relatively poor. So my ability to communicate with him was very limited. Um, in addition, we're using different formats, different technology than would be used at the host institution. So there are obviously some uh, problems there. Um, internet connection speed and reliability, and I say speed and reliability both, they're distinct issues. Brazil is a very developed country. There are leaders in, in industry and technology, and which is one of the reasons we chose to partner with Brazil, because we wanted to make this model course uh, 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 successful for the first time through. Um, they have an excellent internet connection speed, um, but of course speeds vary across dis distances and across institutions. Even here at Case, we've had a number of outages this spring. So um, there are reliability issues, even in the best of circumstances, and, and speed varies such that in some classes, it, it worked very well. In other classes, there was a delay. So I would, I would say something, and it might take four or five seconds for them to hear it. And so with those delays, um, our class would grow longer and longer. <clears throat> Uh, technological imperfections, and I have to be very careful what I mean by imperfections, because I'm sure some people would take issue with this. When I say imperfections, um, the technology worked, okay, the class worked. But technology is not dichotomous. It didn't, it's not a question of did it work or not. It's a question of how well it worked. Where on the scale of this shared classroom did we land? And I'd say we did fairly well, but we didn't have that perfect connection speed. You saw from the example, we didn't have a very clear image of that face-to-face uh, human connection between students and faculty, or that voice connection between, uh, between the sites. It wasn't like being in the same classroom. That's where we have to move along that gradient to be closer to that, that ideal. And I think that we can get there, but I think largely right now is a technological issue, at least for the price point we're approaching. And we chose a low price point so that we could extend this to uh, incomes with low resources. So we don't want to use the most expensive equipment. We want to use inexpensive off-the-shelf equipment that we can take elsewhere and expand it to other countries. Um, video format differences. Um, Brazil uses PAL-M. It's the only country in the world that uses this particular video format. They've used it since the 70s. Um, and it's incompatible with other formats. It's compatible with US NTSC uh, in black and white, but not color. Um, so when we tried to implement Adobe Connect down there, we had a number of problems. And not a whole lot of solutions, because being the only country that uses this format, there aren't a whole lot of answers online. So um, we've, we found workarounds. Like many of the problems we had to do with, we found a workaround. So the workaround was it worked uh, with Adobe Connect with different various settings uh, if we didn't load the Adobe Connect add-on. So when we remove the add-on, it would work. There's something about that software that, that ruined the, the connection, um, which meant that our partners couldn't upload content. They had to send it to me, and I'd upload it. So we worked through some of those differences, which I believe are attributed to the format differences. Academic year and holidays. Uh, Federal University by Brazil had three holidays during our course time. We had one holiday. None of those holidays overlapped, um, in addition to the different academic years, which I addressed previously. There are time zone differences. Obviously, there they were an hour or two hours apart, and it varied according to daylight savings time. 
Um, certainly language is, is an issue. Uh, English was a requirement for the course. In fact, many of the students in Brazil really liked the fact that it was in English because it gave them an opportunity, I think, to, to practice their English. But that doesn't mean that they felt comfortable communicating in English. And I think that some of the discussion was limited because some of the Brazilian students felt impeded by their English skills and they didn't want to be embarrassed by saying the wrong thing. Um, and, and finally, uh, the weekly setup. We could have set this up permanently. We could have used one of the existing rooms that, that's equipped with uh, better equipment, but we wanted to do this in a way that would be translatable to other, not, well, could be adapted to other sites. So it meant getting to, to the classroom awfully early in the morning, getting th things set up, and working through every issue that would seem to be new every week. So we faced another number of challenges, but I think we did a fairly good job of overcoming them. So in summary, uh, we, we focused on content, technology, and human connections. The content lessons were that content and global expertise really necessitated the adoption of these technologies. So we had existing uh, content, we had our expertise, we had our collaborations, um, and we built upon those collaborations to use the technology to accomplish our goals. And, and really the relationships that we had, the existing research and educational relationships, um, it created the shared vision and were the driving force be behind this course. So really, this is collab tech. There's a reason why collaboration comes before technology. And for technology, uh, we want to use off-the-shelf, low-cost approaches for these unique settings. We have a very unique setting here, um, but you get what you pay for. We need off-the-shelf shelf inexpensive answers, but we're not going to get um, a simple push-the-button-it-works solution. We have to spend a lot of time and energy getting our workarounds to work. And those successfully hope for improved connections. And then um, for the human connections, it was great. So faculty on the left, here's myself, Ron, uh, Gloria, uh, Jeremy. It really built upon these uh, con connections for the faculty. On the right, you see students working together in a student data analysis project. Well, nothing new, right? But this is unique. What you don't see in this picture is that these three students are working on real data, not data that I cleaned to make it um, pleasant when they, when they find their solution. It gives a real answer solution to real data that's been collected in real world surveillance. And who are they working with? Well, not just those three are working together, but you can see they have their computers set up with their webcams and microphones. They are talking and working with their student partners in Brazil. And what are they working on? Real data in that partnership, real time, through these connections. So I think these human connections are the key. And, and for our, our last uh, bit, I know we're running low on time, I'd really like uh, you to hear from Dr. Gloria Teixeira, who can provide a, the different perspective from our global partner. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to speak ab about the, this course. And uh, it, it is very interesting, important, and stimulating experience of the Le Collective Health Institute of the Federal University of Bahia, where I work. We would like to thank Case University and the Center of Global Health and Disease, especially Dr. Daniel and Dr. Romban Blanton, who designed and piloted this interview. Our team's evaluation of this course was that it was very good in many aspects, and I will go highlight some. The joint course was an opportunity to have an exchange that involved many students and teachers in, in a genuine academic environment that was facilitated by technology, but it felt natural because in this case, the technology permitted, despite, despite some failures, interactions that were not as otherwise possible. The course aims, topics, and design were arranged to promote mixing of the two cultures and the academic expertise. We were able to incorporate the interests of Brazilian and the American students. We found that the students were able to size on this pioneer's opportunity, and their positive evaluation reflects this. Father, the staff and teacher learned a lot about how to deal with the difficulties of using the technology, how to overcome the language barriers, and how to explain the concepts with and without the physical presence of the students. 
the classroom atmosphere felt different from the usual teacher's experience, but it was good because it permitted, permitted questions, discussion, interaction, and integration of ideas. But, but as Daniel highlighted, we can already see some limitation in the transmission that must be overcome in the next course. I think we are facing a new experience that, that should be encouraged, expanded, and disseminated so that it will be used more often or maybe even become routine for universities and the other levels of formal and informal human education. Thank you very much. Thank you, Florian. So thank you very much. So where are we going next? Um, we're going to build upon this partnership. The course is funded through 2011. We'll teach it next spring. And we're looking to expand this to other sites, such as Papua New Guinea and Kenya, where we have, again, existing and strong collaborations. So in conclusion, I would like to thank the T. Keith Glennon Fellows Program for supporting this, uh, the Center for uh, University Center for Innovation and Teaching and Education, uh, Dr. Mano Singh in particular, Dr. Dwayne Bible at CWR Media Vision for his technical assistance, uh, Genevieve Matheson at ITAC also for technical assistance, uh, Klinger uh, Car Carvalho, uh, our IT specialist at the uh, Federal University of Bahia, Brazil, uh, NIH support for this course, and the participating faculty and students. At this time, I'm happy to take any, we're happy to take any questions. I'd like to know more about the details of how you put the two IT teams together so that you could find out what the networking capabilities were in Brazil versus what's here, how you put the platforms together. Well, uh, I did bring one thing. I, again, like, like Daniel said, uh, one thing that's good about starting in Brazil is that they sometimes are more technologically advanced than we are here. Uh, first time I ever saw an LCD projector was actually there. <laughs> um, but uh, there's a whole four or five pages that the Federal University writes on what their IT service, their history from 1967 to the present, uh, their speeds. They have 61 people as a, a staff for the whole university. In uh, the uh, Institute of Collective Health, which is within the university, there are uh, three people that are responsible for an IT unit. Uh, one of them uh, happened to be there when we were there and was more likely to be there during the course, so we worked with him. Uh, Daniel uh, went down and basically worked with him directly on uh, the material. The Dwayne Bible was on the other end and we made the connection and they worked uh, uh, in November together on um, uh, over the video. Um, but uh, Klinger, it, uh, I was always shocked to find out how many people spoke more English than I thought down there. Klinger's English was not zero, so that mm -hmm. uh, you, you could get some things done. What, sorry. One more question? Were you able to do um, statistical exercises over the internet with each other, for instance, using HLM or anything else? Uh, so the student, okay, so that's a good question. So um, from the faculty perspective, uh, like Dr. Pinho would show mathematical models and she would run her program such as in Mathematica online and we could see the results in modeling. For the students' analyses, they often worked uh, iteratively, so they'd split up the project, analyze it, then talk uh, on, on, online, look at the results, and talk about it that way. But it wasn't like a, a direct uh, visual analysis. Does that answer your question? Thanks. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs>